braking systems. What is the difference between the disc brakes and the drum brakes, and how does the whole circuit work? Well, let's jump in and have a look. The basic principle of any braking system is to take kinetic energy or movement of the car and turn that energy into heat. We do that via friction, either using brake shoes on a drum or brake pads on a disc braking system. The ability of the brake to dissipate that heat into the atmosphere so it can accept more heat when you use the brakes again will tell us how effective and how efficient the brake is. If the brake is already very hot and we try and use it, we get brake fade. If it cannot dissipate that heat into atmosphere and we give it more heat, and it just cannot take it, we end up with brake fade and the brakes are effectively no longer working efficiently. The front brakes on this particular vehicle are disc and the rears are drums and they do this heat dissipation and the braking force using friction very differently. So let's have a look. Now, no matter whether we have discs or drums or a combination of both, nothing will be possible without a master cylinder. Now this is attached to our brake pedal with usually a booster in between which uses vacuum to give us more braking force. As we can see here, we have two inlets from the reservoir, and we also have two outlets as well. The reason for this is we have a front circuit and we have a rear circuit as well. If we lose a circuit, if we blow a hose or we overstroke a piston, we still have the other circuit to rely on because the reservoir itself is also split into two. There is a divide in here, so we can retain the fluid for the circuit that still works, so we can stop the car and we can repair it. We also have a sensor here, which is a low level sensor with a float. Once our brake fluid goes below this level, the float will turn on the switch and it will turn a light on your dash, which is a red light with a brake on it. Usually that is the case. If we see that light come on the dash, this is usually the first place to look. Do we have low brake fluid? And why do we have low brake fluid? On that, brake fluid is also hygroscopic. It will absorb water. Uh, moisture over time will find its way into the braking circuit. And if we get the brakes really, really hot, that water will actually boil off and we will find we have a bit of brake fade and we may lose a bit of brake fluid. The level will actually drop. Inside this master piston here, we have two pistons separated usually by a spring and some brake fluid. And as we push one, both pistons move to proportionally distribute the fluid to both braking circuits evenly. If we do lose a circuit, like I said earlier, we'll actually physically push one piston with the other to activate the only remaining braking circuit. We may feel that we have a lot more travel on the brake pedal, but the brakes still work just not very effectively. So that's how that system works. It's bolted to your brake pedal, and without this, we have no brakes at all. We'll start up front and have a look at the disc brakes. Now, these are the more common brake we're gonna find, especially on light vehicles, and more appropriately at the front of vehicles like this. We tend to have drums at the back, we'll have discs at the front. They consist of a disc, we have a caliper, which is hard mounted to the vehicle. We have this hydraulic line here, which goes to the four pistons that activate the two pads within the caliper. It's not always gonna be four pistons, it may be two. It may even be just the one on the inside with a slide. Now, the good things about a disc like this is we have a ventilated front disc, which gives us very good heat dissipation. We have self-adjusting pistons. Of course, a drum brake, we do have to adjust from time to time with these ones. The pistons will just stay where we left them and they're totally self-adjusting. And like I said, very, very good at heat dissipation. This is what they do very well. We can scale them up with a bigger disc and bigger caliper if we need to, if we wanna go bigger and, and better braking efficiency. Uh, on the con side of things, they are a little bit exposed to the elements rather than the drum. Everything is out in the weather. Uh, they do wear a little bit faster and they are a little bit more expensive to produce. But on the most part, this is the way that the industry is going. Disc brakes are used everywhere. We're even seeing them on the heavy vehicle mining industry. We have some very, very big disc brakes up the front of some of our trucks uh, rather than the wet pack that we see on the back. We are seeing them more and more in the mining industry. One thing is we can't do with these uh, is have a cable operated handbrake for this particular vehicle, uh, but they are coming more and more common where we have a cable operated piston inside the caliper, which is all one piece. We can have a park brake and a caliper in one, something we didn't do back in the day. We'd either have a pair of drum shoes inside the hub, or we'd have to have drums on the back or even a park brake on the tail shaft of the vehicle. So that's disc brakes. What I have here is the new pad ready to go in and replace the old worn one. So there's quite a lot more meat on this one. As you can see, it is brand new. We have a strip of steel here that all disc brake pads will have some sort of strip of steel very similar to this. And the idea is when we reach the minimum spec on the pad, it will start to rub against the disc and make quite a lot of noise. If your brakes are making a lot of noise, we take the wheel off and see if this strip of steel is touching the disc. 
If it is, it's time to change out the brakes. That is the one indicator we know that you're on the minimum spec of your pads and it's ready to change them out. We are very close here, but we're not quite there. We've probably got about two mil left before we need to change these out, but I'm here, I've got them, I'll change them out anyway. And on the back here, we have brake drums. Now this consists of a backing plate, a wheel cylinder here, which activates in both directions. We have two shoes, a leading and a trailing shoe, and we also have the drum itself. As we can see, these shoes are totally gone and we have two new ones that we're gonna replace them with. We also have a parking brake cable here. So this is also the parking brake of the vehicle. We pull the cable and these two shoes pull out at the bottom and they lock the brake. As we can see, it's a little bit more worn on the top than it is on the bottom of the shoe. And that reason is because the service brake operates at the top. We also have an adjustment here in the middle and we can adjust through the back of the backing plate. Now we wanna get the adjustment right. So when we put the drum on, the wheel still spins freely, but the service brakes still activate fairly immediately. And we also wanna make sure that the parking brake doesn't have too much throw in it. We don't want 10 or 15 clicks. We want somewhere around four or five. So we have a fairly immediate park brake. These are as close to the drum as possible without touching. If they're touching, we're gonna to end up with heat. And as they heat up, everything expands and they get more and more friction as you drive along. They'll get hotter and hotter and they'll lock up more and more. But we really wanna get the adjustment of this quite right. And when it comes to the pros and cons of the drum brake, we have a few pros and I think we have more cons. To be honest, we have uh, a lot less cost involved in manufacturing these. They can be cable operated for the parking brake, which is a good thing. They have very good serviceability. These things do last a lot longer than the front pads. I haven't done these rears before and I've done the fronts a couple of times. But on the con side of things, these pads are more expensive to buy, the shoes, if, if you will. Uh, they are no good at dissipating heat relative to the front disc brakes. They do hold a lot of heat, even if they do have more friction surface area, which is very good for stopping. They do hold a lot of heat. They do hold a lot of mud and debris in here as well. It is normally considered a good thing that they're sealed away from the elements, but I do find if you take the car underwater, you'll end up with water in these brakes and that's no good and you can't get it out unless you get the drum off. They also hold a lot of the debris that comes off the braking material. You can see a lot of it sitting around here. It's not very good to breathe in and it doesn't wash out of the brake very well unless you pull the drum off. Other than that, they work perfectly fine on the back of this vehicle, but they're just not as good as disc brakes. And that's why we use discs at the front and we tend to use drums like this on trailers and heavy vehicles where we need a lot of friction, but we're moving slow so we can stop the vehicle without dissipating a lot of heat. You'll find a, a truck with drum brakes like this going down a big hill will get brake fade very quickly. Yes, you get a lot of friction, but no, you don't dissipate heat fast enough. So if we have S-CAM brakes that operate on a truck, they're very good for slowing it down a slow truck, but not very good for slowing down a fast one. We also have on the back of this vehicle and many commercial vehicles like it, a brake proportioning valve. And the job of the brake proportioning valve is to proportion how much braking force is delivered to these rear brakes and to the rear axle. The reason we need a proportioning valve in the back of a vehicle like this is because it is a commercial vehicle with a tray on the back designed to carry aggregate and load and other things that we want to put in the tray of the vehicle. The proportioning valve in this position here with no weight in the back of the tray will give less braking force to the rear and more to the front. As we load up the back of the tray and we move the axle closer to the chassis, it knows because the axle and the chassis will get closer together, it will open up the proportioning valve and give more braking force to the rear axle when the vehicle is fully loaded up and we have more weight on the back and we need more braking force here. We get tripped up here if we lift our vehicle, we put a two inch lift in, or even if we lower our vehicle, the proportioning valve doesn't really know what's going on and it gives less braking force to the rear axle when we lift the vehicle. It thinks, oh, there's no, there's no load in the back of this tray and therefore we don't need any brakes. Where that may not be the case, we've just lifted the vehicle and not adjusted the proportioning valve to suit. Okay, so that's it for brakes. We have our pros and we have our cons. Disc brakes, very good for light vehicles, very good for high speed track days, dissipating that heat, slowing down very fast, but they do wear quickly and they are exposed to the elements. Drum brakes, a lot of surface area, but not very good at dissipating heat. Very good for slowing down heavy stuff that's going very slowly, but not very good for day to day use in your car. So if you're looking at getting brakes for your vehicle, for the most part, disc brakes are where it's at now. They're very adaptable. You can buy all sorts of upgrades and cool stuff. Drum brakes, okay in the back of your commercial vehicle, but not really gonna do the job on the track day. Other than that, thank you very much for watching.